I spent a little time looking for the picture of the perfect church. And this is about all I could come up with for a perfect church. You know, today we need to think about the examples of the faithful service that uh, some of God's first century servants gave us for an example. In doing that, we can compare what we do in our service for the Lord to what they did during their time of period in their service to the Lord. The Church of Christ is a perfect establishment. <laughs> However, its members are not quite so perfect. Every one of us wants to strive to be like Christ, but we're not always like Christ, as we should be. You know, sometimes young children and young Christians are overheard saying that they're in search of the perfect church in which they want to labor. They want to do their best with the perfect people. The older preachers know better. Perfection is not a human characteristic. It's just not there. So the collection of souls into a congregation will make them a less perfect congregation. A wise old preacher once said, there is no perfect congregation. And if there were an, a perfect congregation, it wouldn't be that way the moment you arrived. Because none of us are perfect. Therefore, there's no point in looking for the perfect congregation. It's not there. There are servants, though, whose admirable service is commendable. And some are even in, uh, recorded by inspiration, so that we have those for examples. A congregation of such persons would appear to be composed of perfect servants. You know, we might think that a congregation like that is perfect. What if this congregation and every congregation like us were composed of outstanding servants like all of those that are recorded in the New Testament? Could we call ourselves a perfect church then? No. We're not perfect, not by any means. What if every member was like Peter and John? Remember when they stood before the Sanhedrin? Acts chapter 4 and chapter 5? When commanded not to preach Jesus, they refused to keep silent. They went about their business doing what needed to be done. Acts chapter 4, verses 19 and 20. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. What happened? They were beaten. And they were threatened. Acts chapter 5, verses 40 and 42. So they just continued preaching the gospel, didn't you? Gamaliel was the one who came to their aid, and they agreed with him. And when he, they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let him go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for the shame of his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus the Christ. What a good example for each and every one of us was what they did. What about members like Stephen? As he stood there before the Sanhedrin and the subsequent mob that formed around him, Stephen boldly proclaimed to them the gospel. And they were the severest critics at that time, the Sanhedrin. They really, really did not like the church. Acts chapter 6 and chapter 7. Stephen then boldly proclaimed to them the gospel because they were its severest critics. 
Stephen condemned them. He condemned their sin without respect to person. He preached to all the same sermon. Stephen did not waver even in the face of death. In Acts chapter, six, uh, chapter 7 verse 60, he asked God not to charge them with the sins that they were committing against him. Then he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said that, he fell asleep. Acts chapter 7, verse 60. He gave his life for the church, didn't he? What if every member was like the Apostle Paul, who suffered greatly to preach the gospel? He had a goal. He was going to meet that goal, regardless of what it cost him. We know from reading uh, 2 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 28, what he suffered. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, in labor more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prison more frequently, in death often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. From the Jews... No, three times I was beaten with a rod. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A day and a night. And I've been in the deep. In journeys often. In perils of water. In perils of robbers. In perils of my own countrymen. In perils of the Gentiles. In perils in the city. In perils in the wilderness. In perils in the sea. In perils among false brethren. In weariness and in toil in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst and fasting often, in cold and naked, and besides other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Paul was willing to suffer whatever it took. How about us? Where do we stand as far as that goes? Would we be willing to suffer all these things, much less die like Stephen? You know, Paul preached the same gospel that we preach. But it was to kings and Gentiles and Jews and infidels and elders and Christians and fellow apostles without respect to person. You know, sometimes we don't want to talk to somebody because they're from another denomination. And they don't know the truth. And we are not willing to tell them. You know, Paul condemned sin wherever he found it. And he always demanded their repentance. Do we do the same? Do we sometimes invite others to worship with us? Yeah, we do sometimes. But not very often. What if every member was like Ananias? Acts chapter 9 and chapter 22. Ananias was afraid to serve. But he was willing to do the bidding of the Lord despite that fear. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, Paul, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he is here with the authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Ananias was seriously concerned, wasn't he? If you drop down to verse 17, And Ananias went his way and entered the house and laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. In spite of his fear, Ananias was willing to go to this man who he thought might even murder him. Because he had bound people and sent them off to be killed. So this same Ananias was a devout man. One of good report according to Acts 22 verse 12. And then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there. So I wonder what Ranger would say about us if we asked them what they thought about us as Christians that worship here. Would they compare us with Ananias? Or with Paul or Peter or John? What if every member here were like Darkus? 
Dorcas was a benevolent Christian woman who provided coats and garments for the needy. I know many of our people do provide for the needy. And they provide for members of the congregation as well here. Darkus was a benevolent, benevolent woman, loved by everybody who knew her. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. And they had washed her and laid her in the upper room. And since Lydia was close to Joppa, the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Then Peter arose and went to them, and when he had come, they brought him to the upper room. And all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and the garments that Darkus had made while she was with them. Acts chapter 9, verses 37 through 39. What a godly description of a good woman. She was full of good works and good deeds. At Joppa there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Darkus. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. What if every member were like the Bereans? Those were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness. And they searched the scriptures daily to find out if these things were so. Is that us? Do we search the scripture daily? You know, when I think about this morning's Bible class, I don't want to answer that question. You know, the, the uh, Bereans received the word of God. And they did so with an open mind towards the scriptures. They searched the scriptures daily to confirm that they were being taught. You know, false teachers can spread their doctrine because the hearers do not know the word of God. And they will not study it. So false teaching can grow just unchallenged. They will never even challenge the speaker, will they? After every lesson you hear, you should make time to study that lesson before you return for another one. You need to know whether that last lesson was a false doctrine or not. Whether or not they were teaching you the truth. The Bereans would have done that. They would have checked the scriptures. Know and understand what you just read and studied before you tackle another lesson so that you don't get behind in your studies. If he's a false teacher, let someone know, and both of you question the teacher about the things he taught in error. That includes me, by the way. And there have been those who have pointed out mistakes, and I appreciate that. What if every member was like Peter? Galatians 2, verses 11 through 14. And how about Simon? Acts chapter 8. When Peter sinned and his sins were brought to his attention... He repented, didn't he? Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. When they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision, meaning his Jewish visitors. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles, and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? That's Galatians 2, verses 11 through 14. He withstood him to his face. Because he was a hypocrite. He was a hypocrite. He even carried Barnabas the encourager along with him in that hypocrisy. In this example, Peter is being a false teacher by his example. He had influenced Barnabas and the rest of the Jews who were worshiping Antioch by his example to become hypocrites themselves. Likewise, we see that Simon repented of his sin 
when he became aware of those sins. When Simon saw that through the laying on of the hands of the apostles, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. See, he understood fully what was going on. And Peter said to him, Your money perish with you, because you thought the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this your wickedness and pray God, if perhaps the thoughts of your heart may be forgiven you. And you drop down to verse 24, and he does repent. He asks for their prayers and their forgiveness. What if every member were like the Thessalonians? 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 8. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth. Not only in Macedonia and Archaea, but in every place. Your faith towards God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. Your work is known all over the world. That's what he's telling the Thessalonians. You evangelize. You do the things that God would have you do. The congregation in Thessalonica was dedicated and zealous, so much so that after they had obeyed the gospel, members of the church taught the gospel to other members as required. Wherever teaching was needed, they were there to teach. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20 is the requirement for all of us to do these things. They did not suppose that the proclamation of the gospel was solely the preacher's responsibility. They got out into the communities. They did what was absolutely necessary to do. The first century congregation went out of its way to sow the seeds of the kingdom outside its own city and in two other Roman provinces. Looking at Luke chapter 8 verse 11, now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. They spread this word everywhere, even into Roman providences, where they knew they could probably be killed for doing that. The Bible gives us examples of faithful servants in the New Testament. Those things could be multiplied right here in this congregation. Indeed, it would be wonderful if more Christians today were like these Bible exam examples that we just examined. The Bible, though, it also gives us a list of unprofitable servants in the early church. Remember Ananias and Sapphira? Self-pride? Acts chapter 5? The man who had his father's wife in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 1? Just a pure case of lust. Lust. Demas, chapter 2, uh, chapter 4 of 2 Timothy, verse 10. Who loved the world more than he loved God? You know, that's an unforgivable sin and a sin of eternity. When you love something more than you love God. Diotrephes, 3 John 1, verse 9. He had a large ego. He wanted to be in control of everything, didn't he? Diotrephes. And there are many others with imperfections, just like you and I. We have imperfections, each and every one of us. The question is, do you contribute to the success or the failure of the church here in Ranger? You know, there is no middle ground on which you can stand. It is an either-or question from Christ. Matthew 12, verse 30. He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Are we guilty? Are we scattering people rather than bringing them in? Erring Christians certainly contribute to the imperfection of the church. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We need that dearly, don't we? We need forgiveness of all of our sins, each and every one of us. For your soul's sake, don't remain an erring Christian. Unbaptized believers, you are not an asset to the local church. 
And you need to be baptized for the remission of your sins. Acts 2 verse 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you haven't been baptized or you need to repent, now is the time to do while we stand and sing the invitation song.